In this video, we're going to jump all the way from pairs of random variables to random vectors. So in principle, going from a pair of random variables, which we were calling x and y, to n random variables, which we'll call x1, x2 up to xn, is pretty easy. We can define a joint cumulative distribution function, that's the joint CDF, and this is just this function with a capital F of x1 through xn, and it's the probability that x1 is less than little x1, x2 is less than little x2, and xn is less than little xn. We can from there define the joint PMF for discrete random variables. So this is the same thing we had before, it's just a capital P of x1, x2, xn, and it records the probability that those random variables take the exact values little x1 up to little xn. And finally, we can also define a joint PDF. You could either think of this joint PDF as the um, n-fold partial derivative of the joint CDF for continuous random variables, or it's a function such that when you integrate it, you recover the um, joint CDF. And the point here is that um, these definitions, while they seem to use a lot of notation, have the same form that we're used to seeing with pairs. And so what I want you to do is rather than worry about um, the specific formulas here, I want you to just notice that basically all of the ideas and concepts are the same, and we're not going to be really working at this scale directly in terms of integrals and calculations. I just want you to know that the framework that we've learned is going to carry over to n random variables. Okay, so in that sense, we're gonna have the usual properties, right? So whenever you're dealing with these objects, you're going to know that you're going to have non-negativity. So whether you have a PMF or PDF, it can't be um, less than zero, right? You're going to have normalization. And so that means that if you sum up everything in a joint PMF, you're going to get one. And if you integrate everything in a joint uh, PDF, you're going to get one. Okay, so the total probability is one. And if you want to figure out the probability of an event, let's call it B, then um, the probability that X1 through Xn falls into B, you get by just adding up the pair or the tuples that fall into B in the discrete case, and then integrating over the set B in the continuous case. So in the discrete case, you add, and in the continuous case, you integrate. Okay, and we also have this idea of independence. And independence here is the same thing for random variables. You just need that the joint PMF factors into the product of the marginals, right? So here I've factored it out, or the joint PDF opens up as the product of the marginals. So if that's true, they're independent. Even more definitions, and I know this is going to be a lot of uh, stuff all at once, I'm just trying to get it out all in one place. So the expected value of a function g is just going to be um, averaging that function by weighting it by the appropriate probability. So in the discrete case, what I do is I sum up the function g weighted by the joint PMF, okay? And in the continuous case, I integrate over that function, okay? And I weight it by the joint PDF. I integrate, I have to figure out the range where I integrate. Okay, and for any um, functions, I also have linearity of expectation. What that basically means is if you have expectation, you can always break it up around the plus. So in this case, I have these m functions, g1 up to gm, and I'm adding up these functions with some weights, a1 up to am, and I can sometimes make my life simpler by just breaking up this expectation at those plus symbols, okay? So you can see I'm just pulling out the a constants and I'm grouping the expectations um, individually. And finally, we also have this idea of conditioning, and that generalizes naturally. So the formulas you're gonna see are gonna be kind of unwieldy. The basic idea is, let's say I wanna know something about x1 through xm, given xm plus one up to xn, and these could be any variables that you like. Sometimes it might even be more convenient to think about like a group of variables we'll call x and another group of variables we'll call y with some indices. But here I'm just doing x1 through xm and x plus one up to xn. All you do to get conditioning, you just divide the joint distribution, whether it's a PMF or PDF, by the marginal distribution, whether it's a PMF or PDF, okay? 
So the conditional PMF then of x1 up to xm, given xm plus 1 up to xn, I have to write this big formula, right? So I have to write the thing I'm interested in, condition on the thing that I have. And then I just divide the joint, which is x1 up to xn, by the marginal, which is xm plus 1 up to xn. That's the thing I have. That's true in the range. And it's 0 otherwise. I'm going to write the exact same formula, except replacing the p with f for the conditional PDF. Okay. And again, we're not really going to be working with expressions that are this um, big. I'm just trying to show you that when we're dealing with big data sets and big um, collections of random variables, that the ideas are really the same thing. So the thing underlying all the um, concepts is always going to be the same that we've seen in the pairwise case. Finally, the conditional expected value, all you're going to do if you want to see the average of a function conditioned on some of the random variables taking some values is you just average that function over the values that you don't see, so x1 up to xm, and then you multiply that by the conditional PMF in this case or the conditional PDF in the continuous case. So discrete, you add up the function weighted by the conditional PMF, continuous, you integrate the function weighted by the conditional PDF. Okay, so that was a lot of definitions that we sat through. Um, hopefully we went through it quickly enough that it wasn't um, too much. And the main thing I want to point out to you is that basically working in this space where I have more than two random variables is pretty hard. And the reason is working out n-dimensional sums and integrals is just a hard thing to do. Even if you use a computer, it's going to be tricky. But in some cases, we can get a lot of intuition and uh, progress just by working with first and second order statistics. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I just mean the means and maybe the variances and the covariances. Okay, so specifically for n random variables, we are going to have n means here, one for each random variable, okay? And we're also going to have n squared covariances between every pair of random variables. Okay, so I can define the covariance between xi and xj like this. And I'm going to do that for every pair. And I'm going to kind of remember that when I take the covariance with a random variable in itself, I actually get the variance. So these covariances actually include the variances. And these are nice because they're just one or two dimensional calculations. So they're the same things we've done before. And also they're relatively easy to learn from data. So if I have some data set, it might be pretty tricky for me to work out um, you know, quantities related to probabilities and n dimensions, but to figure out these um, means and covariances is not too bad. All right. So why are these so useful? Well, one reason that they're useful is that it's um, pretty easy to work out, all right, how do means and covariances evolve under linear transformations, okay? So another reason is that if we're dealing with jointly Gaussian random variables, which we're going to do a lot in this course, and actually they play an important role in many um, important applications, they're specified by means and covariances. So that's really all we need. So what we're going to do to make this simpler, instead of writing out those big expressions with n random variables, is we're going to define vectors and matrices to hold those random variables. So a random vector, which we write as x with this bar under it, it's a column vector whose entries are random variables. Okay, so the notation for us is going to be that capital X with a bar under it contains variables x1 up to xn, okay? And then it takes values in this little x with a bar under it, which are just these values, little x1 up to little xn. It has a joint PMF, if that's what you have, a discrete set of random variables. So it's um, written as this x bar, which captures this joint PMF, or it's written as this x bar which captures this joint PDF. So in this way what we've done is taken this n airy notation, so from 1 to n, and made it much more concise by just grouping everything together into a vector. Okay, and we're going to keep doing that, so we're going to organize the means that we're interested in and the covariances we're interested in into vectors and matrices. So starting out, the mean vector of a random vector Okay, so we have a random vector now, and I want to know what the mean of that vector. Well, it's just a column vector. 
and the entries of that column vector are the expected values of the corresponding entries of x, which are just random variables. So this mean vector is just a vector consisting of the mean of x1 all the way up to the mean of xn, okay? So what that means is that if I want to take the expectation of a random vector, I just take the expectation of the individual entries, which are random variables, and I just put them into the vector. Okay, and I can also define this linearity of expectation as a property, and it's the same thing we've seen before, except now I have kind of a matrix vector version. So I have a matrix that I'm multiplying by and a vector I'm adding. So I have ax plus b, and I can pull the a and the b out of the expectation. So that's very convenient. We can do the same thing for a covariance. Uh, we can define a covariance matrix, okay? of a random vector. And this is maybe a little bit more um, involved than the mean vector. So I'm gonna have x minus its mean vector times x minus its mean vector, but I take the transpose. Okay, why am I doing that? Well, let's write it out a little bit more formally. So I have everything out here. So I have this column vector. And then when I took the transpose, I ended up with a row vector of the same thing, okay? So this is what we might call an outer product, if you remember from linear algebra. Not that important to remember. And then if you follow each of these terms, you'll see that in the first entry, I have the variance of x1, and then the covariance of x2, x1, to xn, x1. Now I start over, and I have the, you know, I'm just filling this in. And you'll notice that I have this big n by n matrix of variances and covariance, and the um, the main thing is that the ijth entry contains the covariance between xi and xj, okay? So the row contains the um, first thing in this covariance. So the second row has x2, and then the column has the second entry. So the in the first column, I would see x1. All right, so that's the covariance matrix. Another way that I can think about computing this covariance matrix is just this alternate equation. And it's just that I take the E of X, X transpose minus E of X, E of X transpose. So that's kind of like the formula we saw before. It has some nice properties. Um, most of these will be useful a bit later. So the covariance matrix has the following property. So it's symmetric. So if I take its transpose, it doesn't change. Right? And the reason for that is that the covariance, if you change the order of the indices, it doesn't change. That's why that's true. It's positive semi-definite. So if I multiply it by a vector on both sides, it's greater than or equal to zero. It has real non-negative eigenvalues. That turns out to be very nice. It has n distinct eigenvectors, and they are perpendicular to each other. And these properties will be super useful for us um, a bit later. Okay, so I'm just putting them out there for now, but we're not going to use them just yet. The thing that we will end up using a lot is that the covariance matrix, after a linear transformation, we can get pretty easily. Okay, just like we had the um, variance of a linear function, covariance of a linear function, this is the same idea. So if I have a random vector and it has a given covariance matrix, and now I take another random vector, which is a linear transform then the covariance matrix of that new thing, y, is just a covariance of x times a transpose. This is true for the same reason we've always seen. It's basically um, some application of linear expectation. So if I write this thing out and I start expanding it, so if I plug in the definition of y here, I get these ax plus b terms. And then I'm just going to start um, grouping things together. Okay, so I'm going to use linear expectation to break these expectations out a little bit. So I have a e of x minus b here. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. And I'm going to combine terms so I have the x terms together and the b terms uh, canceling out. Okay, so the b's go away. And I end up with a x minus its mean times x minus its mean again, transpose a transpose. And this uses the fact that the transpose distributes into multiplication like I've shown. And finally, I'm going to use linear of expectation again, really twice to pull the a out of this expression, and just notice that the thing I'm left with inside is just the covariance matrix of x. Okay, so let's finish with an example. Let's say x is a random vector with this mean vector, 1 and minus 1, 
and it has this covariance matrix. So it's going to be uh, 2, 1, 1, and 2, okay? And let's take this linear transform. So y is a linear transform of x, and I want to know the new mean of y and the new covariance matrix of y. And so I just use these two properties that I derived. So I have the linearity of expectation, right? So I just pull out the a and b. So in this case, if I want the mean of y, I just multiply the mean of x by this matrix and add this shift vector. And so I just carry out that matrix multiplication, I'm doing it pretty quickly here, because honestly, this is something that you can just carry out in MATLAB um, or any other software. So this is not something that we're too worried about you being able to do um, by hand, right? Especially as you're getting to larger systems, but I'm just showing you here for completeness. So if you want the covariance matrix, it's just A times the original covariance times A transpose. So that's why I've written here. And I can just go ahead and carry out all of those um, terms. Okay, so if you're interested, you could kind of go back through this or pause and kind of look through the calculation, but this is just a basic matrix multiplication. Okay, so I'm just carrying out each step of this multi matrix multiplication, and I'm ending up with another covariance matrix. And it's going to be 1, minus 1, minus 1, and 38. And the main thing to kind of know as a little check is that the matrix is going to be symmetric. So I'm expecting to see minus 1 in these two off-diagonal positions here. Okay, so they should be the same since it's 2 by 2.